Uh, just a, a quick FYI for folks on this call. Um, we, we are currently being recorded right now at this point in time. There have been a lot of issues with us being able to upload these videos onto our, our Pima County uh, uh, website for the school's meetings. So uh, what we're going to do instead is we're going to create a YouTube channel and we will drop all the videos on that YouTube channel. It's not really an official Pima County Communications um, uh, sponsored thing, but we do need to get that information out to you all um, and, and should have been getting that out to you all uh, a couple weeks ago. So I, I kind of made uh, just a, a decision on that and that will that will be uploaded by later today. You all get a notification with the link to that YouTube channel so you can go back and review any of these videos at your leisure. Um, quick uh, updates. Um, just a reminder, we changed the format of the meetings from here on forward. Uh, we uh, we'll put the um, the the main requested topic towards the end of agenda and uh, do the the uh, uh, the main continual updates towards the front end. That way, if anyone needs to go or uh, uh, doesn't connect to the uh, the main topic of the agenda, um, you all can feel free to jump out uh, at your own time. Um, the uh, the next couple of sessions exempting next week. Uh, we'll be doing vaccinations for schools and vaccine deployments. That's going to be a continual topic for a bit. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that on our agenda today, but it's going to be a limited a limited time frame that we we cover that because there's still a lot of information we need to uh, glean about that specific topic. So uh, the first thing on the agenda last week, I believe it was last Friday, I sent everyone on this call out a uh, I forwarded an email that was a communication from our, our um, county assistant county administrator, Dr. Francisco Garcia, uh, that um, that made it to the news. Uh, it's it's officially what what we've said is continually we will give you a two weeks heads up if the county issues a recommendation to possibly go remote, um, and uh, that last Friday was that official two week notification. We are not recommending, um, like quote unquote, recommending going remote. But for schools who are thinking about doing that, we think it's time to maybe start to uh, begin those preparations. So I'm going to just read this verbatim really quick, and then I'll make some time for questions. Dear colleagues, Pima County is committed to giving you the best and most current guidance as this pandemic continues to evolve. Today, ADHS, and this was last uh, Thursday or Friday, ADHS published on its school's dashboard our first triple red metrics. For the weeks of November 15th and 22nd, the number of cases per 100,000 has exceeded 100 per 100,000 population threshold. And then it gives some specific uh, data points on that. Also saying the percent of hospital emergency department visits reporting illnesses were reported at 7.6 and 10.3%. Um, we do anticipation, anticipate the situation will persist, and next week the state will again report all three indicators and in the red for Pima County. Moreover, we do not believe that any new specific guidance for schools will be forthcoming from Arizona Department of Health Services or the governor's office in the near future. In our communications with the superintendents and school leaders, Dr. Cullen, and this is from Francisco Garcia, uh, and Dr. Garcia have consistently indicated that when all three indicators are in the red for two weeks in a row, it is appropriate for schools to consider a return to all virtual instruction. So uh, this is an important point because I have miscommunicated this and um, and did so on the previous webinar that we had um, last Thursday. Uh, on the last Thursday webinar, I communicated to everyone on this call that um, the county would maintain the stance that hybrid instruction was appropriate and and uh, and would be that would be our stance. But that was a miscommunication. The communication from health department leadership has been the other previous that when those three indicators are in the red for two weeks in a row, it would be appropriate for schools to consider a return to all virtual instruction. OK, so the way that that's worded is, a, is important, appropriate to consider a return. So uh, we do anticipate reaching that threshold uh, uh, today. Um, and uh, schools can start to prepare to make that um, eventuality or that that uh, practice occur at this point. Uh, we make this recommendation despite our continued observation that the overwhelming majority of school related cases are not acquired in the classroom and that continues to persist. Uh, just uh, I'll touch briefly on outbreaks and what that means as of last week. The decision to move to hybrid instruction is appropriately and ultimately in the hands of superintendents and school boards. 
This communication fulfills our responsibility under the governor's executive order to provide local information and technical assistance to school leaders making these difficult decisions. Pima County is committed to supporting all school districts and schools, including those that may wish to continue in a hybrid status. Now, I, I do want to talk a little bit about that last sentence because this is important. There have been some schools who have significantly demonstrated a high level of mitigation and low case counts within their specific school site. And uh, we see this more often with elementary schools rather than our middle and high schools. The reasons for that is because the ease of implementing mitigation strategies at those educational levels is significantly easier. You can uh, adhere to mask guidance, limit classroom sizes if needed, ensure social distancing, and uh, allow classrooms to not interact uh, in between each other, which really mitigates spread overall. <clears throat> there are uh, quite a few schools within districts at the elementary level that are not going to be moving to a remote level. And again, the county will support that. I have looked at the cases from all of those schools that have said that they're going to continue to operate in a hybrid status for the elementary school level. And uh, the, the data there is pretty sound. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna, that's gonna lead us into the outbreaks discussion later. But before I go any further, I'm gonna allow for some time to go back and just address any questions in the chat here. I did note that um, AZDHS recommendation from Pima County Schools is specifically shifted to remote learning. Is there any distinction we should be aware of from PCHD that would help us explain why PCHD has not made the same recommendation as AZDHS? Uh, yes, sir. So the, uh, the primary distinction is the availability of the data sets that we have in terms of what schools are reporting back to us in terms of transmission in the classroom. Um, the recommendation, again, uh, is is only a recommendation, and um, <clears throat> we uh, we we as a county have definitely taken a very firm stance as a health department that schools should be the uh, the last place that we try to close down. That that other uh, jurisdiction authorities should be uh, should come previous to that. Um, and we know that there's a lot of schools that are are continuing to operate mitigation properly within their within their systems. So we will support uh, a school who does wish to continue hybrid status as long as there's not a lot of uh, cases coming out of that school site. Um, and I, uh, we are actually, uh, Dr. Yeager, working on a specific statement to that account. I have a meeting on Friday to get that drafted up. All of the superintendents will receive that statement as soon as it's done. And that's something that you can then uh, make sure that you're using in your communications because uh, we definitely recognize the challenge of that that uh, that messaging. OK, any other questions in relation to that specific topic today? Alyssa, I, I, I will uh, I will try to address that again. Um, if you're not getting them from us, uh, perhaps Penny or Nikki can um, from TUSD can try to forward those on to you or all of the other school nurses within the district as well. And I, I should note that we're not often uh, the only emails that I'm sending out to this group are the invitation to this meeting as well as the agenda. So if you're not receiving those, then um, I, I, mm, there could be a firewall or a block, uh, but I, I'll, I'll go back and add you in again. Um, updates number two here, vaccines for schools. So uh, we know that this is a, uh, a really pressing topic at this point in time. Um, uh, there, there is limited information that uh, we currently know about vaccines um, with schools specifically. We are the the information that we currently have suggests that those vaccines for schools will not be available until March uh, for the larger school body. Um, however, it is of note. And if you just joined us, if you could please make sure to just mute your your speaker or your microphone, that would be really helpful. I'm getting some background noise there. Thank you. Um, so with a, uh, let me see if I can find out who this is and then mute them. Apologies, everyone. Done, okay. So uh, school nurses are the one exemption to this. So um, school nurses actually are, are qualify as vaccine deployment group 1A. So if you are a school nurse, what you will need to do is if you don't have a identification card or a badge that identifies you as a school nurse, you can get a letter with your school district letterhead 
um, or your school letterhead just stating that you're the school nurse uh, and that you qualify for vaccine deployment group 1A, which is this week. So school nurses on the call, you can actually start to register for your vaccinations as soon as that is available. The county is working right now on the logistics to uh, figure out how that's going to, uh, how to how to sign up for those vaccinations. Currently, the uh, deployment is at Banner UMC and TMC. Those are the two sites in which you can register. Um, we had a website mechanism for getting signed up on that, um, and it's not, uh, it, it's not, um, there was there was a few issues that arose with that specific piece, so uh, we're trying to we're trying to get that built in as quickly as possible. There's a team of seven people currently working on that right now as we speak. That does also include health aides. So again, if you're a health aide, if you're a school nurse, all you'll need to do is have your ID badge that cites your your position at the school site, or you can get a letter uh, with your school um, letterhead or your district letterhead on it that states that you are the uh, the nurse, we would suggest that maybe getting an administrator to sign that letter would be also an appropriate mechanism for that. They are trying to really be um, on point with the uh, the vaccinations and the distribution of those because there's some limited um, uh, services there. Um, for Ms. Roche, I don't know about the athletic trainers. My guess uh, is, is no on that one, um, primarily because uh, I, I'm not sure how much um, COVID interaction those individuals would have considering that there shouldn't be any athletics occurring right now um, besides just like solo drill training uh, in serious social distancing. And that actually is a topic that we should probably discuss here today. Um, I don't have information on where to register. Uh, just keep, keep tabs on the Pima County Health Department vaccinations page that is uh, that's still undergoing updates right now. As soon as that is, um, as soon as that's uh, available for folks to start utilizing as a registration portal, then it'll be available. I, I um, I'll try to get some method of notifying everyone on that. Um, but uh, yeah, the best thing to do would be for you all to just keep an eye on that. Okay, and I will follow up with you later, Miss Roche, about that that piece. That's the extent of what I know about for vaccines for schools right now. Uh, oh, oh, and the other thing, custodial staff, food services, transportation, uh, any other anecdotal staff that are, or support staff that are working on a school grounds are eligible for, for school vaccinations in deployment group 1B. So that's another important piece to, to note, okay? CDC quarantine hey, guidance. Yes. Hey, Brian. Crystal's on. Could I make just a couple really quick comments? Yeah, Crystal, please do. Hi, everybody. I'm Crystal Rambo. I'm the Vaccine Preventable Disease Program Manager for the Health Department. I Yay. don't agree you. I just wanted, yeah, I just wanted to make a couple really quick comments. Um, one is that while school health staff are definitely part of 1A, one thing I just kind of want to warn everybody about is that for these very, very early stages where we're basically piloting the um, pod sites, they are restricting it to people who care for, in a sustained way, people with confirmed COVID uh, diagnoses. So basically that really means more like people who work in ICUs and um, med surge units that are caring for uh, people with COVID. So school nurses probably cannot register right now. Um, however, that's probably going to lift pretty quickly. And then everybody from 1A will be able to start to come in to register. So I just wanted to make that clarification. If you guys do get to the registration links and you're not able to get through, that is why it should be temporary and then your staff should be able to be vaccinated. As far as registration links, I can work with Brian um, and my team to get those out and hopefully we can get you guys some more information about that and then he can disseminate it to you all. Crystal, thank you so much for being on today. I know that you are uh, just slammed with stuff right now. Um, I do see a couple hands going up. And uh, Crystal, if you've got a couple more minutes, um, Kathy Steinle, uh, uh, I know you had your hand up first. If you want to ask that question, then we'll jump over to Penny Cuff. OK, I was just going to ask, Crystal, would it be helpful maybe if when it would be OK for school nurses to start trying to register if we get an email through this mechanism with Brian saying, okay, the door's open, so we don't keep knocking on the door and annoying people when it's not time for us to register yet. Does that make sense? So, 
Yeah, no, I definitely understand what you're saying. This is something we're kind of trying to make a plan for countywide as far as how we're alerting people, because unfortunately we don't really have the data management capacity or the staffing capacity to basically um, get all that information in one place and do systematic alerts about when people are due, because there are so many diverse groups that compile this one A population. Um, so I don't necessarily know that I can commit to being able to alert you guys when it is open. Just know that we are developing a system for this and I'll keep communicating with Brian so he can give you guys those updates. But I, I do understand what you're saying, Kathy. I, I hear you. I just think it, since Brian already has contact with um, so many people in so many school districts, this might be an easy way to communicate that information. Mm -hmm. Yes, I to use that contact. Brian. Should we just hold off for like until after the holiday at this point, since they're trying to get the ICU and med search people taken care of first? Yeah, and my understanding is that both TNC and Banner are booked for, I think, at least uh, the next week or two. I think TMC had a bit more availability, but Banner is pretty booked out, I think, well into January. Um, so, yeah, I would say we not until after the holidays would probably be a good place to start. Cool. Thanks, Thank Crystal. You. And uh, uh, yeah. Penny Cuff, you've got a question, and I do have one other in the chat that I'm going to uh, send over to you, Crystal. Okay, yeah. You know what, Brian, I apologize if this has already been answered because I see somebody said thank you after they asked the question, but I need to know because of the model of uh, the health offices, you know, we have health assistants. Are, would they be considered the, the 1A? Just, just, you know, they were not school nurses. We don't have school nurses for every school. And I think Babs had asked that question too um, with, um, with her district because that's our model isn't a nurse in every single school. We have health assistants, and these are the ones that are on the front lines. So are they in the 1A category? Yeah, they are. So they're going to be considered like health care support staff. So those people do fall into the 1A category. So okay, super. Pretty Thanks. much as soon as schools are eligible, they will be eligible also. Wonderful. Thank you. If our district, is our, if our district gets letterhead with TUSD is, on their positions, would that be Okay, if, if our district TUSD um, with the letterhead TUSD with their position, would that be sufficient, what we what our staff needs? Yes, Six. that would be enough to prove their employment. Yes. Great. All right. Thank you again. Okay. You're welcome. And then the last question, Crystal, is dropped there in the chat. It's more of a statement from uh, Bart Peterson, so just another consideration on uh, athletic trainers. Um, I'll read it out to you because it looks like you're on phone. As healthcare providers, athletic trainers are the point of contact for any student participating on campus in any sport practice, even though it might be socially distanced. Where the healthcare providers that assess and refer positives and suspected positives, as well as any normal injuries, sprains, strains, fracture, et cetera, that might occur on a campus after school. And I think uh, the, the general um, gearing is towards consideration of the athletic trainers into the, uh, the 1A deployment group. So if you have any comments on that, Crystal. Um, I guess my comment would be, I, I totally understand what you're saying and I agree with you. We only have so much um, freedom to change these recommendations from ADHS. Um, so, I mean, we can kind of take this under consideration, but I think it's just really important that we all understand that we are beholden to some of these recommendations from ADHS, which are passed on from CDC. Um, and they're, you know, pretty specific about who's included in 1A. And right now I would say that that category of people is probably going to be in 1B, um, but I can definitely take those concerns forward to leadership and we can discuss it further. Did anybody else have any questions for me before I jump off about vaccines or anything related to that? I really appreciate you jumping on today. And um, Miss uh, Susan Tolga, I, I, for somehow, I don't know how this happened, but you got control over my, uh, my screen here. Um, so let me see if I can try to cancel this out, but uh, if you're able to maybe drop that control. Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Is everyone seeing the agenda right now on the screen? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Appreciate that, Andrew. 
All right, uh, two other quick things we're going to jump into here. Come on. Local legislation. Uh, so just a, a reminder for folks here, um, there have been a lot of memos from the county coming out on uh, various topics around COVID. This is the landing page for those. It's included on the agenda in the link. It's hyperlinked into it. Um, the one that we're just going to briefly touch on today before I pass the mic off to our, our guest today is uh, this specific one, um, which was just passed. It's uh, restrictions related to curfew and vaccination plan. Um, basically states that there is now a mandatory curfew within Pima County um, and that there, uh, there are, are specific things related to the enforcement of that. Um, and uh, that also there is a, a vaccination plan that's being put in place. This has been really fast and furious, and I'm really grateful that Krista was able to take just a couple minutes to jump in on this today because um, I know she is really busy right now. So uh, I, I actually, uh, I'm, I'm going to shift around the agenda just briefly. Um, we'll come back to these other things here in a bit, but uh, um, Andrew Squire is the City of Tucson Public Information Officer, and this is a really great segue for uh, him to actually talk a little bit about the City of Tucson curfew. Um, this preceded the, uh, the Pima County curfew, um, and uh, I, I think uh, really modeled out for us what, what the right thing was to do in terms of curbing the spread. So, um, uh, Andy, if you want to just go ahead and um, thanks again for taking some time to join us today. I'm going to put myself on mute and uh, just let me know what you need me to do in terms of navigating the website. Sure, Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to this group of educators and administrators um, and, and staff members in our education system. Folks, I just want to say on behalf of the city of Tucson, thank you for all you're doing. Um, this is a really challenging time and you are uh, have one of the toughest jobs out there um, keeping our, our uh, education system running. So thank you for what you're doing with that. Um, so the curfew, uh, Brian has up the city of Tucson curfew uh, FAQs, uh, which speaks to the initial curfew that the city of Tucson put in place. That is uh, still relatively accurate in the sense that the county did adopt a countywide curfew now uh, at their meeting. Uh, this past week um, that does technically supersede our curfew, uh, but the same type of restrictions are in place. The county basically uh, amended their initial voluntary curfew to line up with the same hours that we were looking at. And uh, it's actually very helpful that it is a countywide effort now, uh, both in unincorporated and incorporated areas, rather than just within the city limits as it was initially uh, for us with a mandatory curfew that's in place. So the the biggest issue with the curfew um, has been the, one of the largest questions has been enforcement um, and and uh, officers on patrol uh, for folks who know will be advising individuals that they encounter as a part of their regular patrol duty of the curfew and encouraging them to comply by getting to their homes as soon as possible unless they're engaged in an essential function or activity. Uh, officers are going to use their discretion on the issuance of any citations for a curfew violation, because the goal here is to ensure that our community is doing all we can to stop the community spread of COVID-19. And, and we're not looking to um, create an opportunity for citations or, or violations. We just wanna help people make, make the best choices they can to, to keep the community as safe as possible. Um, the maximum fine within the city limits is, is a $300 fine. Uh, but that would be diversion uh, likely through our court system if someone was fined for really flagrantly violating the curfew. To date, the Tucson Police Department has issued 46 violations, uh, 46 total curfew violations. We had a very good question um, yesterday, excuse me, on Tuesday with, with the other meeting with educators uh, that was asking uh, for an education member, she was reaching out to students who are graduating and, and applying into college, and her work was requiring her to be out in many cases past 10 o'clock or returning home after 10 o'clock. That's fine. That is an essential activity, um, certainly. It also is going to be the case that it is highly, highly unlikely that an officer would pull someone over for driving around after 10 o'clock. Um, including your your staff members or working individuals who have to be out after that hour. Um, the the only thing 
there would be some other issue that the officer was making a stop for. We do, we do not intend to be stopping people um, while they're driving uh, for violation of curfew. Really what we're seeing is our officers are encountering people generally after midnight, um, leaving uh, bars or restaurants or other uh, facilities that are hosting later night events or functions, and then they're congregating and hanging out. So that is where we've seen the majority of um, warning activity occurring. Uh, largely, it is groups, not a single individual that we're talking to. Um, and in the vast majority of these cases, we, we've seen immediate compliance with the request. Um, so that said, um, businesses do not have to shut down um, at 10 o'clock, but the majority have been anyhow. Um, the uh, the county uh, in their meeting did have a discussion that roughly 15 percent um, of the bars and restaurants uh, seem to be not complying and and that was another reason that they chose to move forward with a a mandatory curfew as well um, so what that means for us with the county curfew going into place and it supersedes us uh, our city attorney put out a little statement that i'm just going to read to you all very quickly that the city and county curfew orders define the same hours for our curfew, which are 10 p.m. through 5 a.m. And our curfew was originally set up to run through December 23rd, but with the county superseding us now, which, which is a more logical date, a lot of people were asking, why is it ending on the 23rd? And part of that was our statutorial structure for proclamations and ordinance. Um, the counties will be in place until such time as the number of confirmed COVID-19 infections in Pima County fall below 100 per 100,000 people based on the seven day moving average. So with that said, that means that the curfew will be in place until we reach that number. So it is unlikely um, based on the current data that that would be prior to the Christmas holiday. Um, therefore, the curfew will stay in place until we reach, and that will include the cities, until we fall below 100 per 100,000 people based on that seven day moving average. So again, that curfew remains in place until we hit that point. Um, checking on this, the other piece that, that is helpful with the county establishing the curfew is they do have the enforcement capacity through the permitting, the health department permits for restaurants, bars, and other facilities that require that type of permit. And violators of that uh, could face losing uh, or having that permit revoked, their health permit revoked. So that is a, an enforcement tool that is very helpful in ensuring that those who are, are making the choice to not comply or not assist us, um, there is something that is at risk at that point and might, might encourage um, participation in this. So I am open for any questions um, that would come in. Again, the FAQ will be updated uh, today on the city page to include the county's information. Um, we very much appreciate the work that is being done by the Pima County Health Department um, that they, they've been an amazing partner for us, uh, working very closely with our emergency operations center for the city and our teams. And, uh, we very much, uh, appreciate their guidance and their knowledge. So any questions I'm wide open to help out and ask. So if you have any questions at this point in time, you can feel free to either drop those in the chat or unmute and ask. Okay, seeing none at this time. Uh, oh, there's a hand up, uh, Barbara Greenbaum. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I just need a clarification that businesses do not have to close at 10 o'clock. No, Barbara, they do not, but we encourage them, depending on the type of business that they are, to ensure that they're uh, making their patrons aware that those patrons should be home by 10 and should not be leaving the business at 10. So that, that would be the goal, but no. And again, it depends on the business, Barbara. What type of business are you kind of referring to? Well, I just I just couldn't wrap my head around the fact that businesses could stay open, yet people were not allowed to be out on the streets. So except for except for essential activities, right? So, so if you're I, a restaurant I, I, or a, go ahead. Right. If a restaurant is open and people are not out of there and home by 10 o'clock. Um, the restaurant could do takeout. 
Yeah, that's right. The, the, now the restaurant, now the restaurant would be in violation. Um, the the real issue is individual responsibility in this case. Um, it's it's really for the city of Tucson with enforcement. It's the individual. The city is not going in. Um, we will talk to a restaurant owner and let them know, hey, you should let your folks know that they really need to be on their way. But post 10 o'clock, essential activity includes going out and getting food. So if you need food for yourself or your family and it's past 10 o'clock, you can go and pick up takeout from a restaurant. Um, again, the goal is to keep folks uh, from congregating in situations where we can, uh, you know, have community spread occurring. So the the businesses absolutely can stay open. Um, and a lot of the businesses do serve essential functions, including the provision of food. Um, but we don't need to be hanging out, you know, uh, in, in congregant groups, potentially unmasked or for long hours in a place where we can spread. Sure. OK, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, ma'am. Okay, any other questions at this point in time? All right, well, Andy, thanks a lot for taking some time. And um, <clears throat> I, for one, really appreciate the uh, the city's fortitude in stepping up and, and taking the lead on this, because I think sometimes uh, the county, uh, uh, the county, um, uh, follows follows what the city does, and our city does a, a really great job at being um, progressive and advancing uh, in terms of of some really difficult decisions like the curfew. So it, it's really it was really great to see the city take lead on that, and it, it enabled us to I think maybe get that done a little bit faster. Thanks, um, Brian. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's jump back over to the agenda. <clears throat> So uh, we're going to jump up to close contacts really quick. Just do a quick review of that. Our close contacts, again, are under six feet for someone who has COVID-19 for a cumulative 15 minutes or more within a 24-hour period with or without a mask. If you've provided care for someone at home with COVID-19, had direct physical contacts such as hugging or kissing, shared drinking or eating utensils, or if that individual has sneezed, coughed, or somehow gotten respiratory droplets upon your personage, you are considered a close contact. Those last four activities have no timeline associated with them. It's really important to reinforce the fact that any close contacts that you all report to the county should only be within the school setting. So we don't need to see uh, the parents or guardians or grandparents listed in the close contacts, only other students or staff associated with your facilities in terms of how you report those. Um, please try to make sure you include all of the contact information. We can't do anything if we just get a name listed in the close contact. So uh, if, if you don't have the information, um, you know, give us a call. Let us know if there's a way we can help you get it, uh, and uh, and we'll work hard to do that. Um, it just makes uh, our our process just a little bit easier if we're able to get that close contact information uh, robustly filled out. And um, Tiffany, if you're on the call, uh, I'm actually going to have you uh, unmute and maybe just add in any other additional information that I may be forgetting in relation to that point. And I know um, uh, just for those of you who may not know, we actually had a uh, 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 the county building Abrams Public Health was uh, evacuated yesterday due to an outbreak. So we're not allowed to return until noon. So Tiffany may actually be in transport getting back to the office right now. Um, but uh, Tiffany is the person who's been following up on cases for you all and has been doing a really great job has freed up my time uh, to get done some of the other stuff. So I'm, I'm really thankful for her. Arizona dashboard metrics, let's cover those really quick here. So for Pima County, oh, and this is the total. Hold on, let me get to the schools one. This was updated on December 17th. And there is a temporary issue displaying the dashboard. Okay, let's try to get it one more time. Reload here. If we don't, we'll just jump over to the county site and take a look at those metrics. One more time. There we go. Okay, so for Pima County, again, we are two weeks uh, in the uh, above the red here um, for cases. Our percent positivity is now two weeks in the red, and our hospital visits are two weeks in the red. Hence that letter that came out. Uh, from Dr. Garcia last week predicting that this is where we were going to be on Thursday. So 
um, officially now we are at that that two week notification that we uh, we would um, let you know about. Uh, two quick questions in the chat box I'm going to address. Are close contacts still supposed to quarantine for 14 days or has it been reduced to 10? Great question, Rhiannon. Uh, it has been reduced to 10 according to county guidance. We expected a little bit of uh, issues getting that new updated quarantine guidance out, but it definitely has been reduced to 10 if mitigation was appropriately followed. So if someone was not wearing a mask, for example, that would not reduce the quarantine. They would have to maintain quarantine for a 14-day period. If someone was wearing a mask and trying to social distance, um, and following the other requirements, then it would be a 10 day quarantine pending the fact that no symptoms have uh, have developed and that that is absolutely no symptoms, even if it's a light runny nose or small headache, anything like that, um, that, we, that we would then move it to a 14 day quarantine. Um, for individuals who are not symptomatic on day, uh, day six post exposure, they can take a test, a PCR nasal swab test if that test result comes back negative, they can get out of that quarantine a little bit early. Um, right now, it's really difficult to get in the door for testing. So if you are a close contact, we are recommending booking your testing immediately to try and get it for the, uh, the day five or day six um, post your exposure to that positive case. Does the health department really want the school COVID-19 point of contact to let you know about staff at home? Testing positive over the winter break. Don't you get notified about any positive tests in the county by subcontractor testing company? Uh, Alyssa, that is a, uh, um, a district decision. A lot of the districts are, are just to make sure they're trying to keep up with the volume of cases that are coming up and they don't have to try to backtrack everything um, over the uh, uh, after the winter break. Um, then uh, you know that that's a that's a district level district decision. Some districts are not going to be reporting cases over to us. Some are going to be just routing cases directly to us. Other cases, other districts are going to be staying on staff to continue to collect case information and reporting it over to the health department. So uh, touch base with your district leadership to find out um, what the details of that are for your specific district. Uh, just to clarify, Banner TMC are the only COVID vaccine distribution sites operating currently. Are there satellite better TMC sites administering the COVID vaccine? I don't know the answer to that question, Ms. Greenbaum, um, and I know Crystal jumped off. I, I believe that's the case, but uh, we would I would need to get someone from testing on, uh, or not from testing, from vaccinations on in order to answer that question appropriately. If they're positive with symptoms, not a close contact is the quarantine 14 days due to having symptoms? No, so symptoms is 10 day isolation. Anytime someone presents with symptoms, it's a 10 day isolation. They can get out of isolation with a negative test result or alternate diagnosis pending the fact that there is improvement on symptoms or there has been a fever free for 23 hours without the use of fever reducing medication. They can be removed from isolation. Remember that quarantine is only for individuals who have been exposed to a positive case or in close contact, okay? How do you register at Banner or TMC? Uh, that de Those details are forthcoming right now. Um, if you can recall what Crystal was saying is they are really limiting to only individuals who are uh, in in COVID units or in long-term care facilities with COVID uh, outbreaks. Um, those are the only individuals that are currently being vaccinated at this point in time for the 1A group. Uh, the details for when the rest of that will be open for registration will be forthcoming uh, a, uh, a date as soon as possible. Uh, written guidelines for the new quarantine rules we can share with parents and staff. Absolutely, as soon as the CDC gets it to me. I am I'm, I, I'm still waiting for the infographic that I was promised from the CDC. Uh, in order to share that out, um, we may have to just uh, go around them and develop something and then and then share that out with you in the next week. But uh, that that is difficult because our communications does not like to supersede CDC guidance. Um, last thing on the agenda to touch base on outbreaks in schools. So last week we had seven outbreaks throughout Pima County schools. That was double the number of what we've had previously. One of the things that you've continually heard me talk about is rates of transmission being significantly low in schools, considering the fact that we have over 600 and something schools operating within Pima County as a whole. Uh, our total number of outbreaks since August is now in 30, 31 or 32. I need to go back and check the exact number. Um, but we had seven last week. This week we've had uh, four. There's a, a potential fifth one that we're um, investigating today. 
what we what we're seeing is that when community transmission increases and community spread increases, that uh, the um, that school transmission um, is is also going to escalate. The number of cases that have been coming in from schools has gone up as well. The one thing that's really uh, keeping our, our guidance solid in terms of the school overall uh, mitigation is the fact that when there is an outbreak, all of the close contacts associated with the initial case have been moved to quarantine before the second case is identified. And that's been fairly consistent. There's been two cases where that hasn't happened because it was an asymptomatic transmission. Um, but uh, again, for the most part, like. Uh, schools are identifying those initial positive cases, getting everyone moved to quarantine rapidly and sufficiently. And it's in quarantine that we're seeing the second case, which still meets the definition for outbreak. Um, we'll have a lot more data and information to share out on future calls in relation to that specific statistic. I do plan to continue to run these webinars over the break, um, just not next Thursday. Uh, but after that, I'm, uh, if if it's only five people, ten people, then that's fine. We can have just a real informal conversation. But I, I will again continue to run those webinars. Um, I definitely encourage everyone on this call to not attend that. Go to the mountains. Go to your happy place. Go to a beach. Go do something relaxing and socially isolate while you do it. Uh, and get yourself some rest. Put away your phone. Put away your computer. Read a book. Um, Get a foot massage from someone that is wearing a mask and full PPE while you are also wearing a mask. But do some things to relax yourselves and get some much, much well-earned rest. Uh, the last thing is the PCHD holiday guidance. I did show this last time, so I am going to skip that on the agenda today. Um, I am going to turn over to the comment box uh, and allow time for questions at this point in time. Um, but I, uh, that wraps up the agenda for today. I'm going to cease recording at this point in time. Oh, any good book recommendations? Absolutely. So I don't know how many of you know about Brandon Sanderson, but uh, I, I'm really into science fiction. Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight Archive series is the fourth book just came out. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to get through that one chapter at a time whenever I can find a minute to to move somewhere else and, and get that read. But the, the fourth one, The Rhythm of War, is fantastic. It's so good. So Brandon Sanderson, everyone, good, good author. And if you're not into reading a couple of thousand page books that are on par with Lord of the Rings type fantasy, then uh, he has one called Legion, which is pretty awesome. I'm going to type that into the chat. And then I'm going to send a screenshot of this to Brandon Sanderson and hopefully he can give me some free merch. And anyone else, if you have any good uh, reading recommendations, type them into the chat. <laughs>